On June 12, 1962, President Yusdado Macapagal spoke in front of a large crowd in Luneta, Manila about the moving of the observance of anniversary of the Philippine independence from July 4 to June 12. Aguinaldo, now 93 years old, though poor in health, attended the said celebration. The moving of independence is not only a form of decolonizing the minds of the Filipino, but also a recognition of the First Republic in Asia in 1898, founded under the design and action of the Filipino revolutionaries of the 19th century. Makapagal in his speech said, In glorifying the short-lived Philippine Republic as the first in Asia, and in recalling our great heroes, it is fitting as we commemorate the anniversary of the declaration of our independence and as we recall the glorious events surrounding it, we should examine ourselves and ask if we have been worthy of the heritage of freedom which our heroes bequeathed to us and for which thousands of our patriots so willingly shed their blood. Let Independence Day therefore be an occasion, not only for commemoration, but for spiritual self-examination. On November 30, 1963, more than a year after Makapagaw's remarkable Independence Day speech at the commemoration of the birth anniversary of Andres Bonifacio, Secretary Salvador Marino read, in Luneta again, Makapagaw's speech titled Bonifacio and the Unfinished Revolution. The revolution of 1896 in a sense remains unfinished. We have yet to achieve freedom from the shackles of an economy beset an inimical landlord-tenant relationship which hinders us from exerting the full measure of our talents and energies. We have yet to achieve freedom from the darkness of poverty, disease, and ignorance. We have yet to achieve the primary conditions that would consider and encourage our people to assume attitudes of purposeful determination, to participate actively in the dreams of our leaders, and to roll up our sleeves and dedicate ourselves to a more active and voluntary share of nation-building. Our unfinished revolution concerns us as individuals and as people. It should steer us as one, and all, just as the spirit of 1896 steered Bonifacio in the Katiponeros. Only then can hope for the common man may become a reality. Makapagal not only recognized this time Aguinaldo's first republic, but also the idea of Bonifacio's revolution as unfinished and interrupted. According to historian Reynaldo Ileto, since Makapagal's triumph in the 1961 elections, the unfinished revolution became a catchword of the decade, of Makapagal and his administration, the radical intellectuals, and the students alike. It became a slogan with a variety of reference. Makapagal did not win his re-election in 1965 because the Americans gave the blessing to Ferdinand Marcos. Marcos, like his predecessors, had the support of Washington. Marcos, in his first years, showed he was a promising president to the people. He enacted reforms that improved the country's economic standing. But this was not sustained as Marcos plunged the country into crisis in the coming years. During his second term, the country faced double the economic problems. The peso, for example, dropped into six to dollar. Marcos started to borrow money in the international community, not to finance his economic platforms but to fund his edifice projects. Corruption remained a problem, and while the country lay waste in poverty and unemployment, his family and close confidants enjoyed a lavish lifestyle. The urban and the working class were betrayed by the promises of Marcos' reform platforms, and his government continued to enjoy American support. Overall, to quote a famous aphorism, the rich get richer and the poor gets poorer. Apart from the mismanagement and exploitation of the Marcoses, many recognize the country is still under the shackles of American imperialism. But with Directo and Laurel gone, the Hook Rebellion defeated, who continued the fight against American imperialism. In the political arena, the torch of nationalism was passed on and left to Senator Lorenzo Tanyada. The enunciations of Laurel and Recto, however, continued to resonate with the younger crop of Filipinos beginning in the mid-1960s. Efforts to assert and spread the ideas of nationalism and anti-Americanism in the 1960s were carried out by academics, radical intellectuals, and the literati in general. Nationalism became the foundation of the struggle. Filipino historians, for the most part, played a role in this resurgence of nationalist ideas. Historian Teodoro Goncillo, for instance, publishes Ovos, The Revolt of the Masses, in 1957. It is by far the most comprehensive historical study of the 1896 Philippine Revolution, anchored on a class struggle framework. 
This was followed by his controversial 1960 textbook, History of the Filipino People, the first to retell Philippine history through a Filipino point of view. Alongside Agoncillo, many other intellectuals were writing on the revolution and the lives of the revolutionaries in an attempt to decolonize a colonial-oriented education, and this mostly shaped the tenor of the growing interest of students to Filipino nationalism. In addition to that, the renaissance of Filipino nationalism led to the creation of the movement for the advancement of nationalism, also known as MAN. MAN would attract university students, leading intellectuals, and some of the former nationalists of the period. MAN was the first and the last attempt of converging a solid and united nationalist movement in the post-colonial years. Senator Tanyada, Jose Maria Sison, Horacio Lava, Ignacio Laxina, and Renato Constantino were the speakers in the founding congress in 1967, held at the National Library. Mann's goal was primarily concerned with political and economic emancipation. As Sison emphasized, Mann is a broad alliance of all patriotic and progressive forces and elements in our society. To stress this fact, we say proudly that materially prosperous but patriotic Filipinos are here and now united with the representatives of the toiling masses. But the target of the nationalists and the patriots was primarily American imperialism, the far cry of the nationalists since the granting of independence in 1946. Historical awareness, emulation of 19th century heroes, anti-colonial sentiments, and nationalist ideologies all manifested in the mid to late 1960s. The beaten Partido Comunista ng Pilipinas started to reorganize through the establishment of left-wing nationalist youth organizations. The Kabataang Makabayan, for example, was founded on Bonifacio Day in 1964. KM envisioned a revolutionary youth that will put forth the interests of the masses. The said group, established by Jose Maria Sison and Nilo Tayag, takes inspiration from the revolutionary Bonifacio and his Katipunan within the context of anti-colonialism and Marxism. Sison later on recognized Agoncillo in his writings to be influential in the maturity of his nationalist ideology and for reviving the glories of the old democratic revolution. The leading nationalist coalition under man declined and perished because of growing interest in Maoism. Internal problems, conflict of interest, and differences in ideologies, however, split the PKP in 1967. The old party members remained under the Marxist-Leninist lines. Sison, a nationalist turned full-time communist, who became influential within the ranks of the old party, re-established the Communist Party of the Philippines according to Maoism in 1968. Marcos was re-elected in 1969, but why? It was in fact considered one of the dirtiest elections in history. Guns, goons, and gold became the three Gs of Philippine politics. Violence, vote-buying characterized the period of the said presidential election. Beginning in 1969, student strikes and a new form of revolution were building in campuses in the streets. University students were unwaveringly joining nationalist youth groups. Agoncillo's revolt of the masses is no doubt influential in this particular period. As discussed earlier, it remains a classic that it became the standard textbook on the revolution that communicates with the masses. The book, for that matter, speaks of a revolutionary alternative that provided high regard in relation to emancipation, militant nationalism, and political independence. According to historian Lisandro Claudio, the history of the Filipino people was more than a textbook. Its radical interpretation of history anchored the militant nationalism of the Marcos years. The activists discovered the colonial and post-colonial sins of American empire, with the Goncillo serving as the one of the left's first helmsman. Although he belonged to a generation older than the baby boomer activists, Agoncillo connected with the youth concerns in a way that the older historians could not. The 1970 edition of the History of the Filipino People was more pronounced in its anti-imperialism and nationalist standpoint than the previous editions. It concluded chapters about the socioeconomic ills that continue to plague the country since the colonial period. The 1970 edition of the said textbook harmonized with the cry of the rising militancy and student power movements. Agoncillo rightfully conveyed the nationalist position of Recto in Laurel. In the early months of 1970, from January to March, massive civil unrest erupted. 
moderate and radical opposition groups joined forces, criticizing American imperialism and the government of Ferdinand Marcos. The urban working class, rural peasants, and left-wing nationalist student organizations rallied in front of the old Congress building, where Marcos delivered his State of the Nation address. The tension heightened. The police and the government security retaliated, beating students with wooden sticks. It was the beginning of the so-called first quarter storm. The succeeding days and months were followed by debacles and street riots. Mass demonstrations were organized by the working class and the peasant groups, which drew support from the student radicals. The first quarter storm showed that the pinnacle of the Filipino youth's radicalism and the establishment's brutality. Unfortunately, the revolution was hijacked by some opportunistic political enemies of Marcos. The Lopez's, for example, offered their media outlets to these left-wing student organizations. The liberals, the oligarchs, and those who opposed Marcos took advantage of the youth's capability to organize. American imperialism remained the main target of these students, and opposition politicians focused their revulsions on Marcos. But the revolution was divided because of differences in ideologies and obvious exploitation from an elite class. The rise of student power in the late 1960s and the early 1970s is only one of the few reasons why Marcos declared martial law in 1972. But we will see in the next chapter of our history how Marcos used martial law to extend its power, violate human rights, establish his own set of oligarchs, and pillage the country's treasury. Thank you.